Durante la reciente visita de los Reyes de Suecia y de una delegación de empresarios de ese país a México, conversamos con o sobre el desarrollo de la tecnología 5G en nuestra región. Según la Asociación Global de Operadores Móviles, para el año 2030, esta representará casi el 60% de las conexiones móviles en América Latina. Pero se requieren inversiones multimillonarias, regulación inteligente, colaboración entre empresas y autoridades, entre otros. Frederick Jedling, vicepresidente ejecutivo, y jefe de la División de Redes de Negocios de Ericsson, nos habló del tema global y también el panorama para la región. It's very interesting that I read from the Mobile World Congress in Barcelona a fact which is impressive. 50% of the world's 5G traffic outside of China is carried over Ericsson network. But I think we had a, when 5G came around back in 2016-17 when that came out, we had a very deliberate strategy to invest and secure that we could stay a technology leader and serve our customers in, a, in, a, in the best possible way. And that meant that we put a significant amount of investments in R&D to secure uh, all the type of different bands that come along with 5G, all the software that comes with that. Uh, and we felt like that was, a, that was required for us to, to, to try to stay ahead of the game. Innovation is very important and our, our customers are very sophisticated buyers and they're very skilled at evaluating our technology. And it has to do with cost efficiency, how you innovate for cost and for energy performance, but also you take care of the very expensive spectrum that typically operators, our customers, have to acquire. So all of that fast forward a few years, we have, we have uh, we managed to secure on the basis of that, uh, uh, that 50% uh, traffic throughput, which we're, of course, very happy with. That, uh, it doesn't come uh, without all the efforts, but uh, we're very grateful for that. And, uh, it's us, up to us now to continue on the track, of course. Which are your strongest markets globally, and how does Latin America fare in that? I think we, we are we're naturally very cross 180 countries across the world because everybody needs uh, connectivity. We got 8 billion subscriptions in the world. It's the most uh, enabling, uh, leveling, uh, cost efficient technology the world has seen. Everybody has a mobile phone, right? Uh, so with that comes, of course, a global presence. Uh, and we are divided into five market areas. Uh, of which um, uh, U.S. is a big and important market for us, market there in, in North America. Uh, we got Europe and Latin America, which is a very important market area for us as well. Uh, and that's, of course, where the Latin America footprint comes into play. Mm -hmm. Northeast Asia, South Asia, uh, etc. So uh, we, we, we are a global company and uh, a lot of our customers are global and require us to be in various geographies as well. But you also need... Uh, to collaborate and to work with governments yes. and different stakeholders to make yeah. this a reality for the customer. Yeah. Um, what about regulation in Latin America? Compared yeah. to other continents, yeah. what do we need to make this yeah. a faster uh, yeah. deployment for you? Yeah, it's a very important thing. Here in Mexico, 5G came 2022, so it's a few years after, but we see very encouraging signs of 5G picking up and delivering the type of use cases that we're used to now, which is basically mobile phones or handsets or pads or whatever it might be. Uh, but, uh, but I think in general it is availability of spectrum, securing that it's uh, priced in such a way that it uh, doesn't take away all the uh, capital expenditures that are required to actually build the networks afterwards. We've seen cases on that. Uh, there are cases in Latin America where uh, some of the payments are linked to actually building out networks, which is not too bad because then you secure the price might be high, but, but there is a there is a facilitation or build out across geographies that are required through the in the spectrum auctions. And that is quite good because then you get then you don't pay all the money on spectrum, you pay it in the way that you do deploy across multiple geographies. So there are a lot of learnings, but you're absolutely right that <clears throat> it has to do with the way that we can contribute and offer our experience for what we believe should be in transparent pricing, uh, openness, availability, and how to construct an auction, etc. that we got experience. Uh, we need to collaborate and we do that very actively in, in Mexico, in Latin America, with regulators, with governments. Uh, and uh, what we're talking about here into 5G is a critical infrastructure. Yeah. And on the basis of it being too costly upfront, it's hard to earn enough return on invested capital to actually build what is the biggest innovation platform in the world, which is 5G. 
So there is a little bit something has to work through. And uh, of course, we're working very tightly with all stakeholders to, to, to get a better outcome across the world. Um, what kind of sectors have benefited? If a customer or if a businessman uh, yeah. or a business community would like to take you know, a vision of the future, yeah. the unlocking of the potential yeah. that you can bring, yeah. which sectors would you highlight? It's a very good question. I think number one, if you look at what we've done, as I started off saying, you know, eight billion people are connected. Everybody can afford and utilize mobile technology across the world. That has been 3G, 2G, 3G, 4G. 5G, <clears throat> we built for something differently. We built it for exposing functionalities that other networks can't do in terms of speed, latency, security, etc. And that points then to the enterprise market, which is a segment that hasn't really been served that well from the, from the 4G technology. So our ability now to build open programmable networks uh, on top of which you can build global network APIs. So a developer can develop an enterprise application not mm. only for uh, the operators in Mexico or Sweden, uh, but rather for the world. Yes. And that's how we think innovation will continue happening on 5G. We utilize 5G in our own manufacturing sites. I have to drink my own Kool-Aid. Uh, and then we have it in our sites worldwide, and it helps us to uh, actually double productivity, and it reduces waste in the system. It has a way of transitioning production a lot faster. So it is an enabling technology uh, that, that, that facilitates innovation on top. Um, and I'm thinking probably agribusiness, uh, or more fun, uh, gamers. Gamers. Uh, I mean, you know. which are those sectors that are pretty much pushing yeah. you know, the acceleration and the adoption. Look, you had a question on the industries. I think manufacturing, uh, is, is, for example, agriculture, ports, or some of the industry. Logistics. Can be, the logistics, exactly. It's good to know where things are in the logistics chains, and not by that margin, but by that margin, because then you can get much more precise in the way you set up your production systems. When you talk about gaming, that's a little bit the other leg. That's, that's uh, the consumer leg, largely. Of course, there's big companies behind gaming as well. Uh, but uh, gaming and the way you can build latency and the way you can embed virtual or uh, extended reality and mix that with the gaming experience that people typically experience on the, on, on, the, on the screen, that is likely to be a big, big opportunity as well. Frederick, thank you for your time. Thank you so much. <laughs>